Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, coming to you on this President's Day, a holiday here in the United States of America, a holiday I often forget about because I'm not American, I'm Canadian, but uh, but it's a good holiday, man. It's a good one, and it commemorates good stuff, and I'm glad it's a holiday. And so being a holiday, you might be wondering, uh, why is there no, why is it AMC Mailbag today, and why is it not AMC Movie Talk the reason it's not movie talk today is because uh, it's it's a holiday and I've given everybody the day off. But film fans still want to talk about movies. So I thought, you know what, just because we're letting everybody else take the day off, we should still talk movies today if you guys want to talk movies. So here we are. And so all we're going to do today, like a regular mailbag, is take your email questions. Now, normally, here's how you do it. You can get a question into us by emailing it to us at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. So you can email a question to us there 24-7. And then what we do every day, Monday through Friday on AMC uh, Movie Talk and on the weekends on AMC Mailbag, we go into the mailbag and draw out questions from there. But um, we're also leave a little bit of time at the end of the show to take live questions. So if you're watching us live right now and... Uh, <clears throat> There are a whole bunch of you watching us live right now. Um, don't leave your questions in the chat board. Tweet your questions to us. Tweet them to at AMC Movie News. Um, that way the chat board stays for chatting, for conversation. Um, and it also means that uh, it's easier for me to keep track of the questions that way too. And it guarantees that the questions are kept shorter too as well. So we can get through as many as we can. So once again... Email your questions to us anytime you want, 24-7, at AMC, uh, or, uh, amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Or if you're watching live, then tweet in your questions to at amcmovienews. So with all of that out of the way, let's get to the first question today. The first question comes to us from... Where does it come from? It comes to us from Andrew. Who, and Andrew writes... Hey, AMC Movie Talk, thank you for reading my question. I am curious as to how does a book become... A movie. Uh, also, do you know what quality studios look for in a book that make it eligible to become a movie? Um, well, basically speaking, look, I, I'm not a, a published author by any means, um, but and and I think much like anything, there are a, a, probably a thousand different roads for a book to become a movie. Generally speaking, though, uh, what happens is you have a literary agent. Um, that's the first thing. A lot of people think that, oh, I'm just going to write a script or I'm just going to write a book and I'm just, and then I'm just going to send it to studios. That's not how it works. Studios don't take submissions. They don't. <clears throat> they work through literary agents. So if you're an aspiring writer, um, step one for you is to get uh, a literary agent. <laughs> that's, and that's a tough thing to do, but that's the first step. But anyway, a literary agent will take your work and shop it around to producers and things like that. Or maybe it just producer happens to catch your book or read your book or whatever and think, I want to make a movie out of this. Either way, either your literary agent or a producer finds you on their own uh, or a literary agent connects you to them. And then a producer will come and offer to buy the movie rights to your book. So a producer comes, let's say it's me. I'm, I'm the producer, okay? And I decide I like your book and I want to buy the movie rights to it. So I approach you and I say, okay, I'll pay you X number of dollars for the movie rights. And then once you sell them to me, now I own the movie rights to your book, all right? And let's stick with, uh, let's say you wrote the book on Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone, all right? So now I own the movie rights to Felipe, the sentient dancing microphone. And now I can start to develop it. I can go out and hire myself a screenwriter to start developing a script, and then I can set meetings with studios to go to see who wants to, to finance this thing, who wants to back it, who wants to distribute it, blah, and I can start putting it all together. But for basically a book, <coughs> it's, it's much the same road to getting your book turned into a movie as it is to getting a screenplay turned into a movie. You got to have pre-existing relationships. You got to have a literary agent. Um, you know, studios don't don't accept unsolicited submissions. A lot of people write me and say, "John, you know, I've written a script, and I'd like to get it turned into a movie. Where do I send my script? Can you send me a mailing address to Warner Brothers or to Fox or whatever?" And what I always got to tell people is they won't accept them. As a matter of fact, even if they wanted to accept them, they can't. They absolutely can't accept them because if they accept every submission. They'll get hundreds of thousands of submissions every year. They'll never read all of them. And let's say next year they decide to make a romantic comedy about this guy and his girlfriend. Oh, but wait a minute. 
this movie they decide to make is kind of similar to a script you submitted. Now you can take them to court and say, you copied my idea because you accepted my screenplay, so we know you read it. And then two years later, you made a movie that looks a lot like the screenplay that I wrote. <clears throat> like studios can't let that happen. And that's why studios say, don't send us your screenplay. We will not accept them. We will just send them back to you unopened, unlooked at, because uh, they have to protect themselves that way. But this brings up another interesting thing. A lot of people will quite often <sighs> moan and complain when they hear about a comic book being turned into a movie, or they hear, hear about a novel being turned into a movie, or they hear about an old TV show being turned into a movie. And they'll go, they'll, they'll lament from the mountaintops, why can't Hollywood come up with any original ideas? Why do they have to go and get this book that was written? And try Why can't they come up with an original idea? And they think they're sounding really smart when they do that. <clears throat> but here's the reality. The reality is every movie starts at the same place. Every movie. Every movie starts with a writer sitting down and writing out a story. Every movie starts there. It doesn't matter if that writer who is sitting down to write out a story is writing out a screenplay, which then gets picked up by a producer, developed and sold to a studio and turned into a film, or if the writer is sitting down to write a novel, which then gets picked up by a producer, brought to a studio and developed and turned to a screenplay, or whether that writer is sitting down to write a comic book, which then has its right, rights bought by a producer, taken to a studio, developed into a movie. It's all the same thing. People like to pretend like there's this magical difference between um, there's some creativity wall barrier between um, Hollywood developing a movie based on a screenplay that some guy named Eddie wrote or a book that some guy named Eddie wrote. It all starts in the same place. A person or a couple of people sitting down and writing a story. And that's how every movie starts. It doesn't matter if it was first written as a screenplay or first written as a book or first written as a television pilot or first written as a comic book. It, does, it doesn't matter. It all comes from the exact same place. A writer sitting down to write a story. Then a producer, and remember, it doesn't matter if that story is a, a novel, comic book, screenplay, whatever. A producer sees the story, thinks we can make this into a movie, Buys the rights to it, develops it, works with the studio, and makes a movie out of it. It's all the same place. So there's no... Oh, hey! Look who's here! My dogs just came running in into the room. I'll try to introduce... Shadow! Also, here's, here's a little... Shadow! Where's Shadow? Bring Shadow... Oh, Shadow's over here. Okay, here's one of my dogs. This is Shadow, everybody. Oh, yes, and Shadow loves me so much. Say hi, Shadow. She's a little camera shy. But this is my one dog, Shadow. And I would introduce you to my other dog, Lily. Except, hello. Yes. Except my other dog, uh, Lily looks exactly like Shadow. They're both dashing. So you're not missing much by not seeing the other one. You want to go get your leash taken off? Hmm? Okay. They just came back from a walk. Sorry about that. Anyway, where are we getting back to? Okay, so anyway, <laughs> it also, every movie starts with the studio going out. And either picking up a screenplay, picking up a book, picking up, it all comes from the same place. There is no magical originality wall taken out of it. Because every single movie starts with a writer sitting down to write a story. It all comes from the same place. It's all the same thing. So this whole bemoaning and begrudging, oh, you can leave the door open. Uh, bemoaning and begrudging of... Um, oh, where's the originality? It, it, the, the originality is the same place that it was in every other movie you've ever seen. The originality was the, with the first writer of that story sitting down and writing a story. And that's where it all comes from. Anyway, that was an elongated answer to a very simple question. Sorry about that. Um, so <clears throat> let's move on to the next question. Uh, the next question comes to us today from Cam Kalglick, who writes... Hey, AMC Movie Talk, my question is, with Sin City, A Dame to Kill For coming out this year, do you think that the movie will do good enough to bring Frank Miller back 
and then maybe give him the power to direct a movie again, because the spirit did terrible, but it would be cool to see some of his other great, uh, greater comics made into a movie, excluding the spirit, because that's not his comic. Maybe his recent comic, Holy Terror? Um, well, here's the thing. Has Frank Miller gone anywhere? I mean, Frank Miller, <clears throat> I will read all of his stuff. Now, I, I wasn't a big fan of his sequel to The Dark Knight Returns. I'm, 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 guys in the chat board, maybe you can remind me um, about who the, um, what the name of the, the sequel to The Dark Knight Returns was. I, I can't remember. All I remember was that, that it wasn't very good. Um, but aside from that, Frank Miller is a brilliant graphic novel writer. He's brilliant. Bat the Dark Knight Returns, my all-time favorite single shot <coughs> uh, graphic novel. Um, his 300, sorry, Shadow's still at my feet. Um, his 300 graphic novel, if you've just seen the movie and you haven't read the graphic novel, read the graphic novel. It's it's intense and it's beautiful and it's visceral and everything that you'd want that thing to be, man. He's He's great. And I do believe we will see more of his work brought to the big screen in the future. That being said, will we see him as a director again? I don't think so. He's terrible. He's a terrible director. The Spirit showed us the Spirit wasn't just a flop. It was a terrible, terrible movie. And what we learned was, and what we always suspected and what we found out to be true was, um, you got Robert Rodriguez um, credited Frank Miller as co-director of Sin City. But what we all knew was was true. No, he wasn't. What you did was you had the big boy director chair that Robert Rodriguez sat in, and then you had the little boy director chair, which Frank Miller sat in. Um, and, you know, really the direction was done by Robert Rodriguez. Same will be true of Sin City, A Dame to Kill For. Um, so no matter how good or bad um, Sin City, A Dame to Kill For does, I don't think any studio is going to let Frank Miller direct another film. Um because he really screwed the pooch with the spirit. Just terribly directed, um, awful, awful film. But Frank Miller's a genius. And I will read anything Frank Miller writes. Uh, anything. And uh, I will give him, uh, I will give, no matter if people say it's crap, I will give anything he writes a shot. Because he has done such great work, and I do believe we will see some more of his stuff on the big screen again in the future. All right, next question comes to us from... Where are we here? From Aaron. And Aaron writes, I love your show. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, so with Jim Carrey, uh, with Jim Carrey returning to one of his old classic comedy movies with Dumb and Dumber 2, do you think there is a chance he might do a third Ace Ventura movie? I'm really looking forward to Dumb and Dumber 2. Um, I'm nervous about it um, because, you know, the directors haven't done real spectacular work the last number of years. And you always get a little bit nervous when they're going back to a classic so many years later. But I also have hope. So Dumb and Dumber 2 for me is a, is a mixed bag right now. It's a mixture of 50% real enthusiasm, optimism, and hope, and 50% nervousness uh, that they could completely screw it. But, but I'm excited. I'm excited for it. Ace Ventura, the first Ace Ventura film, might be in my top 10 comedies easily it's in my top 20 um, that I don't know that there are 10 other films that made me laugh as hard as the first Ace Ventura did when I first saw it so many years ago because I, I think it's been over 20 years uh, since the first Ace Ventura let's put it this way if there was no Ace Ventura 2 Nature Calls and all we had was the original Ace Ventura movie I would say, yes, if Dumb and Dumber 2 does well, I think there's a chance we could see Jim Carrey revisit another one of his classics, Ace Ventura. However, we did get Ace Ventura 2 Nature Calls. In as bad as I think the quality difference between Ace Ventura and Ace Ventura 2 is probably the second biggest gap in quality in film franchise history. I believe the biggest gap in, in um, between a, an original film and its sequel in quality was Highlander. The original Highlander is in my top 10 all-time favorite films. The Highlander 2 is one of the worst motion pictures ever made in history. 
There, that's the biggest quality gap between an original and a sequel I've ever seen. Ace Ventura to Ace Ventura 2 might be the second biggest gap in quality. As funny and as hilarious and as original at the time that Ace Ventura was, Ace Ventura 2, Nature Calls, was a piece of crap. It was just awful and I hated it and I wanted to love it so much. And most people hated it and the critics didn't like it and all that kind of stuff. It made more money than the original because the original was so great. The original was so awesome. Everybody was looking forward to the sequel and they all went out to see it. And yeah, so I'm going to say no, um, that we are not going to see Jim Carrey go back to Ace Ventura. I think there would have been a chance that that could happen had Dumb and Dumber 2, if Dumb and Dumber 2 does really well, if we had never gotten that second Ace Ventura movie. But we did get a second Ace Ventura movie that kind of spoiled Ace Ventura. Whereas Dumb and Dumber never did have a sequel. It's still the classic that we all remember and love, and that's why we're getting a sequel to that. I don't think we're going to get a second Ace Ventura movie. All right, let's move on to the next question. I think, yes, we are on question number four now. And the next, this question is, hello, AMC crew. I love the show. Uh, this is from uh, Nico Caruso. Hello, AMC crew. I love the show. Thanks so much, Nico. Recently on the show, you had been talking about reboots and remakes. Do you think we will ever see a Rocky remake? If not, how about Stallone writing and directing more serious boxing movies again? I think it could be interesting to see a Rocky remake in about 10 years or so. What are your, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think we're, we're ever going to see a Rocky remake. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, so many Rocky films were made. There are six Rocky films. Um, and most of them are really good. I really like the last one. I, I really did. I know not everybody loved it, but I really did enjoy the last Rocky film that he made there. Um, but here's the thing. I don't think you're going to see Rocky remakes because any boxing movie that comes out really are going to kind of have the same themes. Uh, most boxing movies I've seen kind of have the same themes as Rocky. The idea of a down and out guy, you know, working his way up, coming from nothing, the underdog, and then achieving great glory. I mean, that's that's kind of the prototypical boxing movie. Um, so there have been a ton of Rocky films, one not so long ago. Almost any boxing movie you're going to make is going to kind of have a Rocky theme to it anyway. But here's the third reason, and I know a lot of boxing fans get really angry when I say this. Boxing's a dying sport. Um, if you're into combat sports like me, um, MMA is, is taking it over. Every year, MMA takes more and more of the audience away from boxing. Uh, MMA is the fastest growing sport in the world. And now people say I'm biased because I've trained MMA and I'm a huge MMA fan. I've been following it since UFC 1 back in the Hoist Gracie days. Uh, but honestly, I think it's the truth. It's a matter of fact, uh, remember Real Steel, the uh, robot boxing movie? Well, Sugar Ray Leonard did a bunch of the fight choreography for, for that movie. And I was interviewing Sugar Ray Leonard. And, and in talking to Sugar Ray, one of the greatest fighters of all time, he talked to me about how he doesn't have a lot of hope for the future of boxing because MMA is so engaging and so exciting. And even he thinks MMA is going to take it all over. So, so there are my three reasons why I don't think, and I could be totally wrong here. I could be absolutely wrong. But the reasons I don't think we're going to see a Rocky remake is, number one, there are tons of Rocky movies. It's not like it was a one hit. And, and it wasn't that long ago that we had a most recent Rocky film. Number two, any boxing movie is going to kind of have Rocky themes anyway. And number three, I think the, the popularity of boxing is in its decline um, and is being replaced by mixed martial arts. So that's the reason why I don't think we're going to see uh, that made. By the way, so I'm going to take uh, two more, two more mailbag questions, and then we'll get to Twitter. All right. The next question comes to us from, let's bring it up here, Dave Perez, who writes, uh, hello, AMC Movie Talkers. I'm wondering about the upcoming adaptation of The Man from UNCLE. I know they've wrapped filming and it's supposed to be released later this year, but I've heard next to nothing about it. So I would like to get all of your insights. I'm a huge fan of Guy Ritchie's films, and I'm really looking forward to Henry Cavill's first post-Man of Steel uh, role. Thanks from a sweaty movie nerd. Well, thank you, Dave, from one sweaty movie nerd to another. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Man from UNCLE. Um, for three reasons that you kind of alluded to, at least two of them you alluded to. Number one, I can't wait to see another big film with Henry Cavill. Um, I was late to the game. Everybody knows how much I love Man of Steel. I think Man of Steel is just a breathtakingly beautiful, best Superman movie ever made. Um, 
and I love the performance of Henry Cavill. I was late to the game in watching Tudors. You know, you know the show that was, I think it was on Showtime, um, the Tudors. And Henry Cavill was like the second lead character in that, in that show. And I recently watched the entire series. Henry Cavill is awesome in that series. He's really, really good. Um, so Cavill is a very good actor. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing him in that as well. The second reason I'm really excited about is because of Guy Ritchie that you mentioned. Uh, Ritchie is so good. I wasn't a huge fan of Rock and Rolla, but Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, uh, Snatch is is one of my all-time favorite films. I can watch that movie over and over and over and over again. That movie is so great. One of Brad Pitt's best performances, I think. He's so great in that. Um and I even really like his... I know not a lot of people love his Sherlock Holmes films. I like his Sherlock Holmes films. I really do. So not a big fan of Rock and Rolla, but that's that's the one I, I'm not really thrilled with. But I really like Guy Ritchie as a director. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with that. And then the, the third thing that I'm looking forward to is to seeing um, uh, Army Hammer. See how Army Hammer does and how he recovers from the Lone Ranger debacle. Um I loved Army Hammer in Social Network. I thought he I thought aside from Andrew Garfield, I thought he was the strongest thing about that film. I was so impressed by him that I just assumed the first time I was watching that movie that it was real twins playing the role. He Hammer did such a great job playing the subtle differences between identical twins so well, I bought it. And it wasn't just because visually they looked identical, it was because the way they were brothers, they were twins, so there's going to be a lot of similarities, but there are going to be subtle differences, and the way he played those subtle differences, I thought it was a terrific performance. I think he's going to be a really good actor. Now, he's coming off of The Lone Ranger, which didn't make anybody look good, so uh, I'm really, I'm very much looking forward to seeing him get back on the horse, uh, and, and I think Man From U.N.C.L.E. playing off Henry Cavill, it's a really good property under a really good director. I'm excited for it. Uh, I have I don't know anything more about it than you do, really, other than the fact that it's in post production now. It'll be out later in 2014, uh, so we don't have to wait that long for it. But I'm personally very excited for it. All right, next question, and the next question we've got now, I believe, this is the final mailbag question that we're going to take, and then we'll go to the Twitter board. Uh, Anthony Sullivan writes, "Hello, AMC, coming to you from always sunny Florida. Well, welcome, Anthony. My question is." Should the Thing in the new Fantastic Four reboot be mostly a CGI character like the Hulk in Avengers? Or were you at all satisfied with the Thing in the original Fantastic Four? Um, great question, Anthony. And we've kind of touched on this uh, before a little bit. Um, I, surprisingly, I didn't mind so much the, um, the costume uh, Michael Chiklis in Fantastic Four. Look, when I first heard they were going to do a costume for the thing in the original Fantastic Four, I kind of rolled my eyes a bit. I was like, oh my gosh, like, seriously? Seriously? You're, you're going to do that? That is a ridiculous sounding notion. But then you know what? They they took a character, the thing, that I, I would have been tempted to tell you you cannot do with practical effects. You cannot do with a costume. And they turn Michael Chiklis into a pretty good-looking, moving, living, breathing thing. It, not bad. Like, it, honestly, with all the things that are wrong with the Fantastic Four, and there are many things wrong with those first two Fantastic Four films. Terrible movies. But amongst all the things that are wrong, a couple of things that I thought they did pretty well. Number one was the casting of Chris Evans as, as uh, Johnny Storm. I thought he did a pretty decent job as that. But also the costume and Chickless as the thing. I, I was much more impressed with that practical effects costume than I thought was possible. They did a really aces job with that. That being said, you got to go CGI. You do. I think they did the, in the original Fantastic Four, they did the thing as well as you could possibly humanly do it with practical effects and a costume. But it could be done much better with a CGI thing. A motion-captured CGI thing could be awesome. As awesome, I won't say as awesome, but close to as awesome as a Hulk on screen. He could be big and powerful and all that kind of stuff. And I just think CGI is the way to go. 
for uh, for the thing. I mean, they could do a costume and surprise us with how good it could be. But no matter how good they do with a costume, the thing is just one of those creatures that is not meant for a costume, is not meant for practical effects. Much like, you know, Millennium Falcon is not meant for practical effects. Um, it's meant, and I'm not talking, I'm talking about using special effects. Um, you're not going to build a scale Millennium Falcon and actually fly it through the sky. You're going to have to use visual effects. And I think you got to do the same thing with the thing. Um, except for, you know, the Millennium Falcon, you could use just a physical model with the thing you got to use CGI. You, I, I just think you do. I just think that's the next step. And if you're doing a, a Fantastic Four reboot, you've got to do a lot of stuff to differentiate yourself from the old Fantastic Four movies. You got to do a lot. And, and I think one of the key things you need to do is not do a costume thing. You got to go CGI. So that's my feeling on that. All right, guys. Uh, it, we're going to take some time now to go to the live Twitter stream. Once again, if you got some uh, tweets you want to set up, you can send us a tweet. Make sure you tweet it at AMC Movie News. So that's where you send your tweet to if you got a question. Send it there. Uh, I'm going to go through the chat board here. Warning. Uh, unlike the mailbag questions, I have not pre-screened these at all. I'm just going to read them as they come up. I might skip a couple or whatever, but um, so I don't take any responsibility for the quality of the questions, okay, guys? So let's do this. Let's jump in. Um, one of the tweets that came to us a little bit earlier was, Hey, John, uh, why would a studio take such a huge risk on an unknown and new director like they're doing for Jurassic World? Shouldn't they get an experienced director. Um, well, here's the thing about that. Uh, Colin Trevorrow, who's directing the new Jurassic Park film, Jurassic World, he is not a first-time director. He did a really good, very respected, and very buzzed about indie film uh, about two years ago called Safety Not Guaranteed with Aubrey Plaza from Parks and Recreation as the star in it. Um, did a terrific job with that movie. He, the way he handled the characters and the actors and the, the narrative, he did a really nice job on that film. He showed that he has what it takes to sit in that chair and direct a story. And when you got a guy who's got that kind of skill, who can take a narrative and really tell a great story that way, and then he does a great job giving his take on Jurassic World to the producers then I'm totally good with that. He's not a well-known director, but well-known isn't the important thing. It's do they have talent? And uh, Trevorrow, Trevorrow has shown, he's done a full-length motion picture, uh, and he's shown he can do it. So, uh, so I think we're good. It's a little bit different with a director, um, like remember back in the Halo days, they almost did a Halo movie. Peter Jackson was going to direct it, and they got the District 9 um the guy who eventually would go on to direct District 9, Neil Blomkamp, they were going to get him, who Neil at the time, though, keep in mind, had never directed anything other than short films. That's it. He had never directed a full-length feature film. He was never an assistant director on a full-length feature film. He was never a cinematographer on a full-length feature film. He had never even worked in any capacity on any full-length feature film. Zero experience. Um, and Peter Jackson wanted to go with him to direct Halo. And I always thought that was a terrible idea. Now, some people want to say to me, but John Blomkamp went on to do District 9 and it was great. Yes, but District 9 was a story that was his story that he had been sitting on and working with. He had done a short film on it. I think he had been living in the District 9 world for like nine years. And I want to see today, and I love District 9. Anybody who knows me knows I love District 9. But does that mean he would have done a good job with Halo, something that wasn't his own story, that's outside of his wheelhouse? Because what happened? He later did Elysium. Neil Blomkamp directed that Matt Damon film, Elysium. And I'm sorry, it was just a cheap knockoff of District 9. It was the exact same narrative path, the exact same arc character types. It was the same world, basically. And so far, as much as I love District 9, with Neil Blomkamp, I'm like, can you do anything other than this? Can you do anything other than this? Because so far you've done two films. That both have been your stories. And they're just kind of the same thing. It, after seeing Elysium, I became really convinced it was the right decision to stop Halo. Um, because I, I don't know that Blomkamp would have done a good job with it. I want to see Blomkamp being able to direct something that's different 
and not something that's his own original story that he's been living with for five, six, seven, eight years. And until that happens, it's different. But that's a different scenario than uh, Colin Trevorrow directing Jurassic World. He's done a full-length feature film sitting in the director's seat, and he did a great job with it. That gives the producers a lot of confidence. All right, what else we got from the Twitter board? The Twitter board is moving pretty quick. Uh, let's go with uh, Dexter Rose, who writes, What are your thoughts on the Triple Nine cast? Oop, I'm losing it. I lost it. Oh, no, it's down at the bottom. What are your thoughts on the Triple Nine cast? Um... Ah, oh, damn, it's gone off the bottom of the thing. Sorry, I'm going to have to jump up. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm gonna, I am gonna. I lost your question, Dexter. I'm sorry, this seems to move too fast. All right, from John Adam Sava, who writes, question, do you think Abomination will return to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? And do you think it will be in a Hulk film or an Avengers film? Um, I do think, I've mentioned this before, I think they kept, remember at the end of that Hulk film with, um, um, why am I forgetting his name? Ed Norton. The end of the Hulk film with Edward Norton, they kept Abomination alive. Remember, they didn't kill Abomination. And I believe they left him alive for a reason. He's a great villain because he's so powerful. And at some point, when you've got characters like the Hulk and you got characters like the Avengers together, you're going to need to have some of these villains in your back pocket that can pose a threat to Hulk and the Avengers as a whole. I do believe, I don't think it'll be for Avengers 2, I believe at some point we're going to see Abomination again. He's too good of a character. Um, he's interesting. He's ferocious. And he poses a legitimate threat to guys like the Hulk, which is going to be hard to come by in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So uh, I personally believe we will see him again. Yes. All right. Let's go back to the chat board or to the Twitter stream. And we'll take this one from Theo19. Uh, AMC Movie News. Who do you think could play a Hellboy in a re reboot five to ten years down the line? Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. He's going to be completely caked up and make up up. Not that um, uh, Ron Perlman hasn't done a great job as Hellboy. He did do an amazing job as Hellboy. But the, the, really, it's not that important of a question. Just get a good actor uh, who can play it. Just get a good actor. That's it. Um, and since they're going to be caked in five feet of makeup and costumes, it, it doesn't really. And a lot of them will be CGI'd, I'm sure, through a lot of the action sequences. It doesn't really matter. Plus, when you're talking five to ten years down the line, who knows who's going to be good? Uh, we don't know. Five, ten years from now, we may... Eight actors may be in the top ten actors in the world that we've never heard of yet today. So it's really, really hard. Plus, I don't know that we're ever going to see a Hellboy reboot. None of them made enough money uh, compared to how much money they cost to make. So I doubt we'll get a Hellboy reboot. But if we did... Just get a good actor. Doesn't matter who it is, really, as long as they're a good actor. All right, let's go with uh, Oscar Armende. Or, um, I can't pronounce your last name, Oscar. Sorry. Uh, who is going to be the leader of the Sinister Six movie? Green Goblin, Doc Ock, and other villains, uh, or another villain that we have not yet seen in that movie? I've got a feeling a goblin will probably be the leader of the Sinister Six. Um, that's just a guess, though. But if we're if we're going under the assumption from the trailers that um, that Oscorp is really the genesis of where all the Sinister Six characters come from, then it kind of stands to reason, and if there's an Osborne is going to be Goblin or Green Goblin, then it kind of stands to reason that Goblin would probably be the leader of it. But once again, that's just a total guess out of my rear end. I, I don't really know for sure, obviously, but my guess would be it would be uh, a Goblin. All right, let's go here. Uh, Jordan, uh, let's go with uh, Nathan Melia, who writes, thoughts on Narnia 4 being more of an independent film? No, I, I think I kind of addressed that before, the Narnia idea. Um, no, no one's going to make a Narnia 4. Uh, let's go up to Colton Irvin. Do you think that Ben Affleck will direct his own standalone Batman film? Uh, I think one of the reasons that Warner Brothers wanted Ben Affleck so badly um, was because they want him directing at some point in this DC Cinematic Universe. I have very little doubt that he will direct his own Batman film, but I also really believe he'll be the director for Justice League. Um, there were rumors about two years ago that Warner Brothers desperately wanted Ben Affleck to direct the Justice League they already had. They had a script already written a long time ago. And eventually they dropped it, um, but Ben Affleck had turned it down. And I really firmly believe that when Warner Brothers went after Ben Affleck, it wasn't just for Ben Affleck, the actor, which was a great choice to play Batman, by the way. Um, but they wanted Ben Affleck 
probably the hottest director in Hollywood right now. They wanted him to direct some films. So I personally have no doubt that he will be directing his own Batman film. And I also, I really believe there's a very solid chance that he'll be the one directing Justice League uh, when Justice League finally comes around. All right, let's go back here. Uh, Cameron York writes, Kevin Hart and Seth Rogen had a buddy cop film during the seg during segregation rumored, and I was wondering what happened to that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's still happening. It's, oh gosh, you know, it's been a while, but I know we just announced not too long ago on Movie Talk that there was a, a new Kevin Hart thing. He was teaming up. I think it was with Seth Rogen. So, and I think it might be shooting. I'll have to double check all of that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel really confident in what I just said, but I think that is happening and I think it's already shooting. I'd have to double check that. Um, this is one of the dangers of just taking questions live of the chat, but I believe that is still happening. I believe I could be totally wrong, but that's what I believe. All right. Um, new Taylor writes, John, have you ever cried in a movie theater before? If so, what movie was it in a movie theater? The only time I had tears coming out of my eyes, like I think just right out <laughs> was, was the end of, uh, <clears throat> um, life is beautiful. Uh, the Roberto Benigni Italian film, uh, which I believe Roberto Benigni won best actor for. He might have even won Best Director for that. I'm not totally sure. But that, that's the one. I mean, I got choked up and had water in my eyes for like Toy Story and Up and things like that. But I think the one where I actually legitimately cried in theater um, and not at home watching on video was was probably Life is Beautiful. Dude, I, I, can't, I cannot recommend that movie enough. If you haven't seen Life is Beautiful, find it and watch it. It's amazing. Uh, next one. Um... Blake Swillhart, what biopics would you like to see happen? I'd personally like to see a Stanley Kubrick movie of some kind. Um, yeah, I don't know that I'd be into a Stanley Kubrick film. Um, I, I, I'd watch any movie that he had made. <laughs> uh, to me, Jim Henson. Uh, when you read the story of the life of Jim Henson, it's really quite fascinating. And how he developed everything and grew everything and, and the obstacles he had to overcome and the challenges that he faced all throughout his career to his ultimately far too young of uh, uh, passing away. Um, but Jim Henson, the mastermind, uh, I would, I would be, I would be interested and I'm not big on biopics. I'm not tremendously big on biopics. It's a very rare biopic that I get really excited about. Mandela is one of them, uh, but one that I would be quite interested in would probably be one on Jim Henson. Uh, let's get a few more here. David Olivo writes, question, what's your opinion on the Marvel one-shot about Mandarin? It's more important than you thought. Um, I hesitate. The reason I haven't taken any mailbag questions about this one-shot, uh, this Mandarin one-shot starring Ben Kingsley um, is because I don't know if, I mean, it's just a silly little short, so I don't know if this would be con considered a spoiler or not. All right, you know what? I'm going to talk about it. Warning to those of you who have not seen the Marvel one shot on Mandarin, okay? I can't remember what the name of it is. Um, but I'm going to give a spoiler as to what happens, okay? So you might want to plug your ears for the next 60 seconds. So basically, it, it picks up where Ben Kingsley, who played the fake Mandarin in the movie, is now in prison. And it's a fake little one shot about his life in prison. He's being interviewed by this documentary crew about the role that he played in that whole fiasco. And he's enjoying the life of a celebrity in prison. But what you eventually find out is there's a real Mandarin out there who is very displeased with the fact that this actor used the name of the Mandarin, you know, doing this big hoax on the world. And the uh, news reporter, the documentary maker, is actually an agent of the Mandarin sent there to kidnap Ben Kingsley out of the prison and take him to the Mandarin to face punishment. So, I mean, and what I always said, you know, I like Iron Man three. I, I, is it as good as Iron Man one? No. Is it as good as Avengers? No, but it was better than Iron Man two. And a lot of people were really upset with the film because they thought it ruined the Mandarin. And they would say, Look what they did to Mandarin. They turned Mandarin into a joke and Mandarin's a great character. And I would always say to them, whoa, whoa, wait, wait one second. You don't actually think that was the Marvel Cinematic Universe Mandarin, do you? That was a fake Mandarin. That wasn't Mandarin. 
So they didn't ruin Mandarin at all because that was clearly not Mandarin. And always said, I, I wouldn't doubt if at some point they go back to, you know, the Ten Rings and actually make a Mandarin. And uh, this one shot kind of suggests that there is a Mandarin out there. However, that being said, I don't think they're going to bring it into the cinematic universe. I think they just did that as a one shot to be fun and quirky. Maybe they'll do a couple of other one shots. I don't think we're going to see Mandarin in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, though. I could be wrong. Could be totally wrong. They, they could be. They could use them in Avengers 2, for all I know. Uh, I'm just saying I don't think that's what they're going to do. Uh, so, uh, so there you go. Anyway, let's go on to the next Twitter question. And the next question from Twitter comes, um, uh, AMC Movie News. Do you, uh, this is from Owen Cooper who says, do you think, let me say, do you think studios change the character's race because it's cheaper than making movies starring lesser known minority characters? No. No. No, I don't. No. That's, no. <laughs> Just no. Uh, next. Uh, Mocktron writes, um, hey guys, if Godzilla is a success and it will be, will they make a King Kong reboot remake and make both of them fight in a movie and how, um, I don't, we've talked about this before. If, if Godzilla is a big hit, I don't think we're going to see a King Kong reboot, but I wouldn't doubt them doing the next Godzilla film as Godzilla versus King Kong. I don't think they'll reboot King Kong and have King Kong in his own standalone movie again. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if they did Godzilla versus King Kong. Much like in the DC Cinematic Universe, right? They start with a Superman, Man of Steel, and now they're going right into Superman versus Batman. I think it would be the same thing. I think it would be Godzilla movie and then Godzilla versus King Kong. I don't think you'd have a King Kong movie in between. Uh, once again, I'm just speculating. Could be totally off, but that's the way uh, I'm, I'm guessing it. All right, next one comes to us from Adam Exvard who writes, hey, John, got a question about the Venom movie. If we remove Carnage from the plot, who do you think could be the antagonist? Um, uh, man, that's wide open. Could be anybody, anything, really. Um, I mean, it could be him on the run from Spider-Man. I mean, I, I mean, I just really don't know. Carnage seems to be the logical um, fit. It's a great question. Say, okay, if he's the one logical fit, what do you do if he's not in there? Good question. But Carnage is the logical fit. So honestly, I don't know. It's an excellent question. Uh, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Leave it in the chat board, whatever your thoughts. Who do you think could be a good um, uh, foil for Venom in a Venom standalone movie? Because we know a Venom standalone movie is coming. We just don't know who's you know what the plot's going to be or anything like that. So uh, let us know who you think could be a good on-screen cinematic foil uh, for Venom. All right, we're going to take two more. Um, Walter writes, what are the chances of Darth Malgus in the new Star Wars? Thanks. Love the show. Uh, honestly, I think the chances are, are zero to nil. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see him there. Um, this one comes from Christian Johnson. John, do you have a Blu-ray collection? And if so, what are your three favorite Blu-rays you own? Thanks. Keep up the great work. Um, this is going to sound really stupid considering how terrible I always say the prequels are. Uh, I love my prequel. Um, so, oh wait, you're asking specifically Blu-ray. I don't have the prequels on Blu-ray. Uh, the reason I do love the prequels, uh, the uh, f you know Phantom Menace, um, uh, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, the reason I have those is because as bad as the movies are, some of the best behind-the-scenes extra special features on a DVD I've ever seen. Seriously. Um, if you want to be inspired as a filmmaker or as a storyteller or to do stuff, Watch all the special feature stuff on the prequels DVDs. They are inspiring and awe-inspiring. I mean, they're they're really really great. Um, outside of that is my Lord of the Rings Blu-rays. My Lord of the Rings Blu-rays. All right, last one I'm going to take, and then we're going to call it a day. Uh, David James Stroller writes: Question: Best actor as Sherlock, RDJ or Cumberbatch? Um. Pass. They're two such different Sherlock Holmes. Um, for instance, I don't believe Robert Downey Jr. could play the Sherlock Holmes that Cumberbatch plays nearly as good as Cumberbatch does. At the same time, I don't know that Cumberbatch could play 
the Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes as good as Robert Downey Jr. did. They're, they're really two different characters despite having the same name. So I'm going to have to cop out on this one and take a pass. And since I'm taking a pass, I'll take one more just for fun. Um, I'll be a little more selective about this one. Let me see. Um, uh, everybody wants to ask Avengers questions. Let's see here. More comic book questions. Uh, Jeepers Creepers 3. Oh, let's take this one. Um, Theodore Sweat uh, is asking, Hello, AMC Movie Talk. Love your, your, love your guys' show. Uh, oh, I lost it. There it is. My question is, why haven't they made uh, a Jeepers Creepers 3? Um, I believe they have. And I believe it's going to be straight to home video. Um, the first Jeepers Creepers... Is actually one of my all-time favorite horror films. I, and I know a lot of people go, what? Jeepers? Yeah, it it legit creeped me out. That first one I thought was really creative. It creeped me out. I thought Justin Long was wonderful in the movie. I thought the monster was badass. It was legitimately creepy. I thought it was great. I wasn't so big on Jeepers Creepers 2, to be honest with you, but Jeepers Creepers 1 was great, and I, I thought it deserved a third one, and I know they had plans for doing a third one. I thought it was already shot. I thought they had done a Jeepers Creepers 3, and it was already in the can, just waiting to be distributed, but I was wrong about that. They were planning on doing it. They had the screenplay, and they had the cast, but it never actually went into production. From what I understand now, uh, they did go into production if I'm right about this, and I could be wrong, but I've heard that they're doing it, but it's going to be a straight-to-home video thing. So uh, no theatrical release for Jeepers Creepers 3, if my information is correct. All right, guys. That will do it for me for today. Thanks so much for joining us on this. This was just a laid-back, relaxed, just let's talk movies holiday edition. Uh, once again, for those of you who joined us late, the reason there's no movie talk today is it's a holiday here in the United States, and so I figured I'd give everybody the day off, And but uh, you and I still want to talk movies, so we thought we'd do a, a movie bag or a mailbag. We will be back with AMC Movie Talk again tomorrow. Please make sure you come back and join us at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for the live stream or just watch us anytime afterwards on YouTube. Oh, I want to tell you about this. This is kind of cool. Um, for anybody who's a Breaking Bad fan, you know that one of the stars of Breaking Bad, Aaron Paul, has his new film coming out, Need for Speed. On Wednesday, um, after we're done movie talk, Aaron Paul is coming into studio with the director and, and, and one or two other cast members of, of Need for Speed as well. But Aaron Paul is coming into the AMC uh, movie talk studio to talk Need for Speed. And we'll probably air that on Thursday, but we're... Keep an eye on my on my social media channels because we're going to be asking you guys to send us questions to ask Aaron Paul. Um, so keep your eye on that. I'm really excited about that. It's going to be really cool having him in, in the studio. So keep your eye open for that. So anyway, that'll do it for me. Don't forget, guys, lots of great films playing at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to... Where is it here? There we go. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. For heaven's sake, if you have not seen the Lego movie yet, go watch it. And if you have seen it, go watch it again. Like... I've seen it uh, three times in theaters now, and every time I watch it, where is it for? Anyway, every time I watch it, because there's so much happening, I am picking up new things every time I see this movie. So if you've only seen it once, I highly recommend you go see it again. Um, so yes, don't forget, head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater showtime and movie ticket information. Uh, you can follow me on uh, my various social media networks on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever. Just add John Campia. I make a lot of announcements from there, so you might want to follow me there. Um, and thank you, you guys, for like on this holiday, taking time to, to spend with me um, and, uh, and on this day, thank you so much. Really appreciate you hanging out and you're chatting and sharing the video and, and making AMC movie news work. Really appreciate it. Everybody love you guys. Thanks a lot. So until next time, my name is John Campia for AMC movie news. And until then, bye-bye.